It was well for Noah and his family, but it was not so good for those people left outside. So as we consider the genesis, the origin of everything from this wonderful book, we'll learn some facts that I know people don't like very much. Some of the research I've done this week, you can tell that people do not like the fact that Christians believe there is a flood. In fact, the first point that I want to make very clearly is that the flood of Noah's time is a fact. Now, it may be a fact that you don't like. It's certainly a fact that geologists don't like. But I'm going to give you just a few thoughts while we're together tonight so that you can think, is it really true? Is it reasonable to believe that there was a worldwide flood and there was a person called Noah? As we found with the book of Genesis, we find quite often we get the first mention of things all the way through this book. And we've got the first ship being mentioned. And of course, as you know from the, 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 the record, that there's, I think we're, we're one down, Dave, I think. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, the first ship in, in the Bible was Noah's Ark. We don't know of any other. In fact, the Bible quite clearly tells us that there was no rain prior to the flood of Noah. I think something else was coming up from the ground and watering the earth. And the thought of a flood and the need of a boat was just ridiculous. That's why people were laughing at Noah and his family as they toiled. The study I've made maybe round about right. They took about 75 years by the time the, the sons were old enough to help. I expect they all got uh, involved with their Black and Deckers or, no, they wouldn't have had those in those days. Their ads and their axes and their hammers and what have you. And they were putting together this boat and it took a long time. They may have asked some of the people or hired other people to come along and help them, but we don't know but they certainly took the plan from God. God gave Noah the plans. And we'll explain a little bit later on uh, just what those plans were and how beautiful that design is and how relevant it is to the tankers and liners that we see on our seas in these days. Remember, Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So he was an old man when he went into the boat and he lasted eventually 950 years before he died. But his son Shem was still alive in Abraham's time. So let's begin to see how this story isn't just Chinese whispers, you know, send three informants, we're going to a dance, uh, the old story of the trench message that went, went out, uh, send, through, send reinforcements, we're going for, uh, to advance. Uh, it didn't get mugged up like that. It was passed on by people who knew, who could verify, who could go back and say, is that so? And of course they could tell them quite definitely it was. So the flood of Noah's day was a year long catastrophe. It wasn't just 40 days and 40 nights. That was the rain. It was a year long, in fact, over a year possibly, a year long catastrophe of huge proportions. We can't begin to understand it. It, it destroyed the pre-flood world completely. It reshaped the continents, buried billions of creatures. We Today, you say, oh, we've got this fossil and that fossil, and they found one the other day, didn't they, in the Isle of Wight? Another dinosaur, great, you know, you find fossils all over. There's billions of fossils, and they're all buried in rock layers all over the Earth, and particularly sea creatures and 
creatures that were in the water anyway, but they were obviously buried very, very quickly. There's fossils of, of a fish eating another fish. And either the fish didn't taste very nice or he got stuck in his throat. No, he was caught. He was killed by the, the weight of the uh, sediment coming down on him that the whole thing was fossilized forever. There was another fish that was giving birth at the same time. There are other animals that were eating at the time and suddenly they were, there was something catastrophic happened. It wasn't just somebody died and they rolled over and they fossilized because it needed to be, the body needs to be covered very quickly to, to produce fossils. But we won't go into that in any more detail than we have. It was God's judgment on man's wickedness and we've got to remember that. The people that got on the ark were spared. God had a plan and he sent his servant Noah to preach righteousness, preach salvation, preach, come to my boat, get on the boat, and you'll be saved. The animals had enough sense because God <laughs> called them. Noah didn't have to go beat in the bushes to get them. They came at God's command and they had the common sense as animals often do. Uh, we talk about football hooligans as animals, and I think we're insulting the animals sometimes because <laughs> they show far more sense than we do. And certainly in this case, they showed uh, little interest in what God has to say. I showed you a picture uh, last week of uh, a ridiculous boat. This boat here is actually... Um, a picture of a small scale model that looks something like that, perhaps. This is a scale model using the dimensions. Nobody knows exactly what shape it was, but that's a suggestion that Noah's Ark was something like that. Or it was just a chest just a box. It didn't need to be a speedboat, did it? It needed to be stable. It needed to float. It needed not to leak. And it needed to be big enough to look after the animals in the ark. We've got a generation growing up now. They're called millennials. And they frequently laugh at the, the, the stories of the Bible. And I wonder why. It's because we have, in Christian bookshops, and I've checked this locally and I've checked it in other places, uh, I've got a slide here of various books and kits that you can buy about Noah's flood. There's just some of them. Now, can you remember the one that I showed you? Uh, a few weeks ago. It was absolutely ridiculous. I mean, okay, they're cute, they're quirky, uh, they're colourful and they sell well, but they're a travesty of what the real ark was like. The real ark was solid and it was safe and it lasted for the whole time that it needed to. May, may have been more sophisticated shape like this, who knows? But it was certainly had windows on the top like we read earlier on, and there was a huge boat able to look after uh, all the people that God sent, uh, the, the animals and, and the people that decided to go in. So <clears throat> if you have a look at the, the ark, the ark, there's, there's a chart of... Uh, the parameters, if you like, uh, that you need when you're doing shipbuilding. You need to have comfort. You don't want to be like poor old Lewis Hamilton in his car, <laughs> like this, getting shaken to bits. And these people wouldn't want the Babylonian Ark. The Babylonian Ark, according to the records, the tablets of, from uh, Babylon, it was a cube. Well, we, they, they would have been zorbing, wouldn't they? <laughs> 
<laughs> it would have been awful. They would have been smashed to pieces, and so would the craft. But this boat is perfectly proportioned. It gives comfort, the best form of comfort available. It gives the best stability. You wouldn't give the best speed. You don't want speed, but you do want stability. And you also want strength as well. To have a boat made of wood this long was impossible then and it is still today without putting steel and other reinforcement in. There's no boat that's ever been bigger than this made simply out of wood. God's design is perfect. And if you make a boat like this, you make it of this proportion, it will be a successful boat. There are many flood le legends around the world as well. And I think many people um, poo-poo this, but it's important to know that there's, there's at least 270 of them. One record said 500. Well, let, let's be conservative and say there's 200 records of this flood around the world. Where do they come from? Well, all from Bible colleges or Harvard or, you know, uh, a church somewhere? No, no. 19 different accounts come from North America alone, from the population there. The Hawaiians, ever been to Hawaii? I've never managed that yet. They have a flood story that tells of a time long ago, and the death of the, after the death of the first man, the world became wicked and a terrible place, exactly what Noah's account says. And look what his name is. It is Nu, N-U, hi, hyphen, U. Nu, U. It's almost the same as Noah. And the waters came up over the earth, and only Nu, U, and his family were saved. Fiji. Have you ever been to Fiji? You wouldn't expect Fiji to have a flood story, would you? It does. They have a flood story too. Another one from China, and their flood character, their Noah-like person, is Fuhu, F-U-H-I, well, fu I suppose, fu -hi. I don't speak Chinese or anything else for that matter, but uh, he had three sons and three daughters, and they escaped the great flood, and everybody else on earth was killed. And after the, the great flood, according to their story, they repopulated the world. So we've got a story, an account, that isn't just something that we tell kids because it just keeps them amused for a while. And we don't want those children to grow up to think, Noah's Ark, silly thing, you know, sort of thing you'd have in the bathtub, isn't it? Yes, it is. No, if you know exactly what the proportions are and you make the model to suit, these both are scale models and give you a pretty good idea of how big and how stable that boat was. The accounts that we have, we've already mentioned a few, the Gilgamesh epic was one, and the Noah-like figure there was a chap called Utnapishtim, and uh, it took me a long time to learn how to say that. But <laughs> Uh, he, he's the, the, the Noah-like figure. And in the British Museum, there's uh, the Gilgamesh epic is shown there on a clay tablet. And it's, it caused a global sensation when it was discovered because it's probably the most famous clay tablet in the world. And it's all about, or not all, but it mentions Noah's flood. Then there's the Atrahasis epic as well of a family that escaped the flood in a ship and they offer a sacrifice when they leave the ark. Exactly according to the story that we have in the Bible. In fact, the boat was called Preserver of Life. Isn't that interesting in the story? And there was a giant flood that would wipe out all life. Now, many Christians, I've heard them uh, tell me, uh, as a young man, and I've heard other people say, oh, it was only a local flood. 
Heard that one? Doesn't fit. Total nonsense. All life was destroyed. Even above the, the mountains. We don't know how the mountains were shaped at that time because it was such a catastrophic uh, event. Waters coming up from underneath. You know those vast amounts of waters in, inside the earth. They broke through and the rain came down and it was a terrible time of God's judgment upon the world. And we don't know uh, what the old world was like and the new one was completely different. Jesus obviously believed in Noah because he linked his second coming with the story of Noah. You, now, you don't do that. You, your major doctrine that you want to share with people is, I'm coming again and I'm going to put everything right. You wouldn't fix it to a fairy story, would you? Jesus didn't because he knew that there was an Adam and Eve, there was a Cain and Abel, and there was... Noah and his wife and their family. It's incredible to know. And of course, when he spoke about Jonah, if you remember, he was talking about Jonah in connection with his resurrection. So Jesus knew about the Old Testament. He could quote it, he could recite it, and he could talk about these characters. Next time you're in America, <laughs> Don't fall down the uh, If you go to Williamstown, Kentucky, you can find a dirty great big boot. In fact, it's the largest wooden structure in the world. It's made of wood. The Amish and a few others uh, were involved in uh, constructing it. Millions of dollars went into it. And you can go and visit this life-size Ark, something along that shape, but big, much bigger than football fields, huge, and it's quite something to behold. I've never been able to go yet, but I'll be very happy to go and have a look over that. If we compare that with other boats, for instance, the one in, right in the background is the Queen Mary too. Now, so, well, that's bigger than the bigger than the Ark, uh, yeah, and uh, the Titanic, yeah, that was bigger than the Ark, but they weren't made of wood, were they? They were made of metal as well. And once you get over, like the Wyoming there, that's around about uh, what would it be, 500 feet? Yes, about 500 feet long. But they used to measure sometimes the bow sprit as well to make it longer. <laughs> But if you have a, a boat of that size, it breaks its back if it's made of wood. It has to be stiffened by something. Unless, of course, you've got a perfect designer who <laughs> tells you how to build it so it doesn't bust and break in half, which it would if we constructed a boat like that these days. In 1980, about 95 miles south of, of Seattle, that would be the Washington State, not Washington DC. So it's, it's up near Vancouver, that sort of area. There's a place called Mount St. Helens. And Mount St. Helens used to look like that. But in 1980, in 1980 uh, there was an eruption. And the upper 396 meters or 1,306 feet blew off the mountain. Huge eruption. Minor compared to some of the things that went on during the flood. This is just an example that we've lived through that makes us say, oh, I see, I, I get it. And if we look at that particular mountain, we find that it devastated nearly 600 square kilometers. That just that explosion that destroyed an enormous amount of timber, just cut trees down like as if they were toothpicks and just wrecked them completely. 
it was equivalent to many Hiroshima-sized atomic bombs. And that was just a, an event that's happened in our life. Just a small part of your daily intake of news, maybe. You didn't think very much of it. But if you've got any worries about Noah's flood, check up on Mount St. Helens, and you'll find that it, there is a little tiny illustration of what obviously happened when there was this huge eruption, this huge catastrophe that went on for a year and afterwards, possibly, that changed the face of this world. There's a place called Engineers Canyon. Here it is. You say, ah, that, that, that looks like uh, the Grand Canyon. I've not been there either. Well, it's only a small version of the Grand Canyon. And you say, oh, there's a river down there. The, the river eroded it, did it? Uh-uh. No, that happened just after this eruption. And it happened within hours, about nine hours, and that was formed. People say, oh, it takes billions of years for these things to happen. No, it doesn't. Here's another one, a huge gouge that took days that came from this particular event. Then rock layers. I'm sure you've all seen people say, oh, there's, there's the rock layer. There's the picture of the woman. You can get an idea of how uh, tall this is. This all happened in just a few days. And there's all the strata. You go to the Grand Canyon, they say, well, one million years ago it was this, and two billion years ago it was this. And, uh -uh, not true. We're being told things that are not true. So it's important for us to make sure that we know a little bit about this world so that we can check up and find that God's word is truly the thing that we should remember. Floating trees were found in the lake just down the road, Spirit Lake. If you've ever been to Yellowstone Park, you'll see that there are trees that are in volcanic, where a volcano had erupted, and there they are, buried upright. These trees, with their roots on, were pulled out suddenly by this event, and they, they just sank to the bottom, and people that had lumber businesses were in dire straits, such a thing, because millions and millions of, of dollars of timber were just blown away. So Christianity is a reasonable faith. It's something you can test. This, this is a picture, actually, of somebody who built a boat. I don't know, it's certainly bigger than this. But he built it to this sort of proportion, and he put it on the sea, and it was perfectly stable, and it didn't break in half. And he proved to himself that, yes, God's word is true. In Hebrews chapter 11, it tells us that Noah, by faith, built an ark. He, when he was warned by God, he listened to what God had to say, and he built an ark to save his family, and he did. On this ark in Kentucky, I've not been, as I said, but if you do go to it, there is a door on the side of the ark. And we emphasized that when we were reading, there's just one door. You remember God closed it. Some of the other uh, Babylonian events and uh, stories that other people closed it, but God closed the door uh, when he was ready to send the flood. And you'll notice there's a cross on that door because Jesus later on was going to come and say to the people, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, or woman, or boy, or girl, they will be saved. It's important for us to recognize that this boat is what technically, in theological terms, uh, we call a type. Uh, image just means a symbol. It's something that's similar to Jesus. Going in to this boat saved Noah and his family. Going into Christ and that Christ come into your life saves you eternally and that's important for us to remember so make sure that you've given your life to the Lord Jesus 
a man came to D.L. Moody, the great preacher, on one occasion, and he said, no, I don't feel saved. You, you ever met Christians like that? Ever felt like that yourself? I don't feel saved. Look, look, we human beings frequently use feelings as the, as the be all and end all, don't we? If I don't feel saved, then I can't be saved. And D.L. Moody wisely said, was Noah safe in the ark? He certainly was, the man replied. Well, what made him safe, said Moody. And the inquirer got the point. It was the ark that made him safe, not his feelings. How foolish, he said, I've been. It's not my feeling, it is Christ who saves. So my question to you is, have you entered... The ark. Now, we haven't got a flood to, to face these days, but as we've mentioned before, God has promised that he will judge this world again, not by a flood, but by fire. He's coming to judge this wicked world, and we're part of it. And if we come to the cross in repentance and enter through Jesus Christ, we can be saved. It's the only way that we can know that we are saved.